grace and peace. Back to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 28. Mark 10, verse 28. This is New Testament video 131, Mark lesson 31. Mark chapter 10, verse 28. Heavenly Father, thank you for another day of grace. Thank you for this time of study. Thank you for your word preserved in English, the King James Bible. And if I encourage and enlighten us, in Christ's name, thank you. Amen. Mark 10, 28. Mark 10, 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all, and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospel's. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. Matthew. Matthew 19 for the parallel. Matthew 19. Verse 27, Matthew 19, 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Come over now to Luke. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Verse 28. Luke 18, 28. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Okay. Come back to Mark chapter 10. Mark 10. In our previous lesson, we saw there was a rich young ruler who came to the Lord Jesus Christ and asked. Mark has it. He runs. He's excited. He's enthusiastic. Good master, what must I do to be saved? He's a rich young ruler. And so the Lord, remember the Lord, Mark 10, verse 18. Mark 10, verse 18, the Lord Jesus replied, Why callest thou me good? There is none good, but one that is God. He says, If you'll enter into life eternal, keep the commandments. You want to do something, huh? Rich young ruler, here, do. Keep the commandments. Master, all these things I've kept from my youth up. All right. One thing you lack, the Lord responds. Go your way, sell what you have, give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Come take up your cross and follow me. And when the rich young ruler heard that, mm, no, uh, don't believe, don't think so. He was sad at that saying, verse 22, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. This is Mark 10, 24. But Jesus answered 
He answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Man's salvation is impossible with him. He can't do it. God can save. God can rescue man from his sin problem. However, there are materialistic individuals here in Christ's earthly ministry. Even today, the love of money is the root of all evil. Idolatry. Idolatry. Materialism. Ye cannot serve God and mammon, Matthew 6 says. Mammon is wealth deified, a god in other words. They worship the almighty dollar. And in those days, no, it wasn't the dollar. It's the shekel or the denarius. The point is, they focused, they had more trust in their earthly possessions than in the Creator God. And since in Israel's program, they're waiting for Antichrist in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Antichrist is a materialistic individual. His evil world system is materialistic. And in Revelation chapter 13, they can't buy or sell unless they have the mark, unless they accept the Antichrist. They're cut off from the economic system. So the Lord Jesus Christ had instructed his disciples in Matthew 6 and Luke 12. Sell what you have. Give to the poor. And they did just that in Acts 2 and Acts 4. Literally. Now this man in Mark 10... He said, oh, no. He had many great possessions. <laughs> His many great possessions had him. He didn't want to relinquish. Okay. Well, this man is an idolater. He will accept Antichrist. See? His his associates, those who share his attitude, in Israel, they're ready for Antichrist. And when the Antichrist shows up, future from our day, he would have come 2,000 years ago, but our dispensation delayed that and pushed it out into the future. Israel's prophetic program will resume one day. It will pick up where it was paused. There are materialistic individuals who... who in, 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 Daniel's 70th week, who are like this rich young ruler. They don't want to give up their earthly possessions. So when it's time to take the mark and a Christ, in order to retain their possessions, they'll accept Antichrist and they're damned. Revelation 14, 9 through 11. They worship his image, they take his mark, doomed. Everlasting destruction for them. They were astonished. Mark 10, 26. Who then can be saved? The wealthy, they're blessed of God. And the disciples were shocked. Well, if this man, who was wealthy, rich, the, the quote, blessed of God person, if he can't get into the kingdom of God, who can be? Say that who can get into the kingdom of God? Now, Mark 10, 28, Matthew 19, 27, Luke 18, 28. Peter, the spokesman of the little flock, of the 12 apostles, he reacts in this manner. Lo, we've left all and followed thee. Lord, 
We were not like that rich young ruler who refused to let go of his possessions. We're not wealthy. Why are we not wealthy, Lord? Look, lo, pay attention. We've left all and have followed thee. So the way Matthew has that, Matthew 19, Behold, 27, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? In Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, 28, then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. So we've left all, we've followed thee. Didn't Peter and Andrew, brothers there, and James and John, brothers, in Mark chapter 1, didn't they leave all and follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Back in Mark chapter 1, look in Mark chapter 1. See right here? Mark chapter 1, 18, straightway, Simon and Andrew, brothers, forsook their nets and followed him. Then James and John, sons of Zebedee, Mark 1, 19, verse 20, they sh straightway he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hard servants and went after him. So Peter, Andrew, James, and John, those four apostles, they had left their businesses behind, fishing businesses. Back in Mark chapter 2, the apostle Matthew had left his tax collecting business behind. We can also look at Luke 14 and Luke 18. They were to leave their material possessions behind and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. After they would come to Him by faith, then it was forsake all. Don't love this evil world system. Now look at Mark 10. Verse 28, see, Lo, we've left all and followed thee. Peter and Andrew and James and John, fishermen, they left their fishing business. Matthew, he left his tax collecting business. All the other apostles, they'd left their jobs behind to follow Jesus Christ. They were not attached to this evil world system. They were serving God, not mammon. So Peter, as is recorded in Matthew, asks, What shall we have therefore? A reward. Okay. They are already justified unto eternal life. They're part of God's family. But what will we have in terms of, re of reward? We're justified. We're forgiven. We're members of the little flock. We are God's kingdom of priests. We've left all our possessions, earthly possessions, behind. What will we have as a reward? So here's the issue of reward again in the prophetic program, in the kingdom. Jesus replied, it's only in Matthew, this is recorded, Matthew chapter 19, Matthew 19, 28, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve tribes of Israel. Why are there twelve apostles? Because each apostle will sit over one of the twelve tribes of Israel. They will be princes over the twelve tribes of Israel. That's why there are 12 apostles. Now Matthew stresses that kingdom glory because Jesus is king in Matthew. In Mark, that's absent. But they're still looking forward to that day in the kingdom when they'll rule and reign with Christ during the thousand years. Mark 10, 29. Verily, I say unto you, now this is in Matthew and this is in Luke, there is no man that hath left house, see what they've left behind? 
Brethren, sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the Gospels. Now, what is that Gospel there? That Gospel, remember, when we see the word Gospel in the Bible, we don't automatically assume, that's our Gospel. That's the Gospel of grace. That's Paul's Gospel. No, no, no. See, we're not naive. We're not shallow-minded here. When we see gospel in the Bible, we look at the context and let the context determine what that gospel is. Okay. Always, 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 always. When you see the word baptism in the Bible, or you see the word gospel in the Bible, or you see the word church in the Bible, be sure, be sure, be sure to let the context restrict that definition to that setting. Always let the context determine what type of baptism it is, if it's water or some other type, if it's the church, the body of Christ, or some other church, if it's the gospel of grace or some other gospel. Always, always, always be mindful of that. When you see gospel, don't automatically shout, Gospel of grace! Let the, let the context tell you what gospel that is. When you see the word church, don't automatically shout, That's the church, the body of Christ. That's us. No, not always. When you see baptism, don't automatically say, Water baptism! That may not be true. Mark 10, 29. There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the gospel. So that's the gospel of the kingdom. This is not our gospel at all. So don't be concerned with selling what you have and giving to the poor. That's for these people in this gospel program, the gospel of the kingdom. But he shall receive an hundredfold, Mark 10, 30. Now at this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. That's unique to Mark there, with persecutions. Matthew doesn't have that. Luke doesn't have it. But Mark does. Persecutions. You've, you, you've uh, left all, little flock, haven't you? You've left your family, all the unbelievers. You've left your houses. For my sake, and the gospel of the kingdom's sake. But that's all right, because when the God of the Bible gives, he's not a miser. When the God of creation, when the God of Israel bestows His grace, He's not stingy. Israel, little flock, my believing remnant in Israel, you've left all that you have on this earth, haven't you? For me, okay? for my sake, you did it in order to follow me. You lost it all. Well, not quite. You lose your life for my sake. That's when you really lose it all. Under the Antichrist, that's what will happen to Israel's little flock, a portion of it, of it. Israel, everything that you lose for my sake. Don't fret. Don't be concerned. I will pay you back. Mark 10, 30. I will pay you back 100-fold everything that you lost for me. I'll give you back a hundred times more than you had before. When the millennium is brought in, there will be such peace, health, and prosperity. Israel will be immensely blessed of God. Until then, though, Israel, there are some persecutions. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's true of us today in the dispensation of grace. 
We aren't promised, as one brother put it, we aren't promised a rose-petaled pathway in this life. We're living in enemy territory. As members of the church, the body of Christ, Satan is the god of this world. We live in this present evil world. Galatians 1.4 If you think it's bad today, Wait until we're gone up into the heavenly places and the Antichrist arrives. Oh, it's not going to be a picnic in the park, certainly for them either. But you know what? We have it mild compared to what the persecution that Antichrist will heap upon Israel's believing remnant. Imprisonment, starvation, decapitation, beheading. That's, that is what's in store for Israel's little flock. Even now, as they wait, as Israel waits for Antichrist to come and Jesus Christ to return to deliver them. In the world to come, Mark 10, 30. In the world to come, Israel, you will have eternal life. Eternal life for them. Eternal life for them. Eternal life. Eternal life is defined in John 17, verse 3. What is eternal life? Well, read the Bible. John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Eternal life is having fellowship with the only true God, the one true God, through the mediatorship of Jesus Christ, his Son. Now Israel, Israel is waiting to fellowship with Father God, not die and go to heaven. They're waiting for God's earthly kingdom to come down, see, God's kingdom to come down on the earth, and they will be his kingdom of priests in the earth. They're waiting for the kingdom to come. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. See, they have a different hope than we do as members of the church, the body of Christ. Whereas we're waiting to go to heaven, they're waiting for heaven to come down to them. Thy kingdom come. Eternal life for them is living in the earthly kingdom. Eternal life for Israel's believing remnant is living, is reigning with Jesus Christ in the thousand years on the earth. They'll inherit everlasting life. Matthew 19, 29. Mark 10, 30. Eternal life. Luke 18, 29 and 30. Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come life everlasting. See, the world to come that's when they get life everlasting. They have to wait for God's earthly kingdom to experience eternal life as God wants them to have. We, we have eternal life now. We're fellowshipping with Father God through Jesus Christ now. I sure hope so. Know why? Because if we don't have eternal life now, we go to hell. Okay? So, we have eternal life now. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, 23. We have eternal life now. Israel has to wait until Christ's second coming to experience eternal life to the full. Mark 10, 31. But many that are first shall be last and the last First. What a reversal, huh? What a reversal. Matthew 19, 30 has it like this. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And then there's that parable in chapter 20, the first 16 verses. And Matthew 20, 16, So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Many being first there in Israel is in the sense of preeminence. They're esteemed in the eyes of the evil world system. The apostate religious leaders, the wealthy, and so on. See, these 
unbelievers are looked upon more favorably by man than the disciples of Jesus Christ. Christ says, you know, those people, the ones who sinful man, who man, whom sinful man esteems now, well, they'll be last. They'll have no reward. They're part of this evil world system. They go, they're cast into the pit of hell, that shaft there. They'll be last. Then it says, and the last first, the last first, the last, the people who are last there. That's the ones who are the nobodies in Israel. There, there's Israel's believing remnant. Sinful man looks down upon them. God will esteem them. And they'll be first. So there'll be a reversal. The nobodies in Israel right now, the believers in Israel right now, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the people who are looked down upon, they'll be exalted in God's kingdom. Those who are exalted now in Israel, the apostates, the unbelievers, well, they'll be last. There'll be a reversal. Those who are esteemed of men now will be despised of God when Christ returns. Those who are despised of men now, they'll be esteemed of God when Christ returns. Mark 10, 32. Mark 10, 32. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them. And they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve, and began to tell them what things should happen unto him. Here's the third time that he's mentioned. His impending death. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. This is now the third time that he speaks of Calvary in the future. Back in chapter 8 of Mark, two and a half years into his earthly ministry, he now reveals to his disciples that he will die. Mark chapter 8 is the first time. Matthew 16 is the parallel. Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9 verse 31, For he taught his disciples, this is number 2, And said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Now, the first time Peter argued, the second time they didn't understand, they were afraid to ask. But as Matthew has it in chapter 17, they were exceeding sorry. They eventually did realize what he had said. And now in Mark 10, the third time, what does he say now? We're going to Jerusalem. Calvary is only, is less than six months away. Actually, it's, it's, it's far less than six months. By the time chapter 11 of Mark opens, Calvary is less than one week away. He's en route to Jerusalem. His Galilean ministry was finished, was terminated back at the start of Mark chapter 10. Christ had conducted his Galilean ministry for over two and a half years here. Mark 9.33, Christ left Capernaum. And then we see as chapter 10 opens, he's in the, in the area of Perea, Perea, the farther side of Jordan, in the coast of Judea. Judea is here, Perea is here. Farther side of Jordan, 
and the coast of Judea would be here, east of the Jordan River. Christ is here. He left Galilee, comes down. He conducts a ministry in Perea. Less than six months. Eventually he'll leave Perea and travel westward, across the Jordan River and enter Jerusalem. There's the, quote, triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. He rides on the donkey. He knows what's coming. I'm aware. I know the future. I know what prophecy says. I know what the Hebrew Bible says. I know what my Father wants me to do. The Son of Man. The Son of Man there. The Son of Man. Adam was called the Son of Man in Psalm 8. Adam should have reigned for Father God's glory. He didn't. He followed Satan deliberately. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. There is the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He reigns for Father God's glory. The Son of Man, for now, however, he's not headed to Jerusalem to sit on David's throne. The Son of Man is headed to Jerusalem to die on Calvary's cross. I have to go to the cross first before I can wear the crown. Before I can sit on the throne, I have to hang on the tree. And here I am, I'm en route to Jerusalem, exactly as my Father wants me to go. I'm headed there. I will be delivered. I'll be betrayed. That's Matthew's word for it. I will be betrayed unto the atheists and the publicans and the prostitutes. No. I will be betrayed unto the chief priests, religious leaders, apostates, and unto the scribes. Oh, those are the Bible teachers, the Bible copyists. The people in Israel that Satan is using to fight against God's will for Israel, these are not harlots and atheists and publicans, tax collectors. Tax collectors, publicans, and harlots, those were some of the most despised people of the, 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 the most despised professions of that day. Harlots and publicans. Hmm. But you know, in Matthew, go read in Matthew. In the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, the publicans and harlots, they're believing John the Baptist's message. No, is it? The lawyers, the scribes, the Pharisees, Israel's apostate. Who is who is? going to take Jesus Christ and try him and crucify him in unbelief is the religious leaders, the people who had the Bible, the people who supposedly read and taught and believed the Bible, but didn't. The Bible will profit us nothing, my friend, if we have it but don't believe it in the heart. And that's exactly what Israel's problem was in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They carried a Bible around they talked about the Bible. They were religious. They were pious. They were devout. But it was all vain works religion. They didn't believe anything in the Bible that God actually said. It was all in the head. It was a mental ascent and not belief in the heart. We're going up to Jerusalem. Mark 10, 32 and 33. They're going up to Jerusalem. We're going up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is over 2,500 feet in elevation. 760 meters high. We're going up to Jerusalem. We're going up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in the mountainous area here. We're going up in elevation. Going up in elevation to Jerusalem. 
and they're approaching from the east. It says Mark 10 46, Jericho. Jericho is right here. They're in Perea right now. They'll eventually cross, cross the Jordan River, coming westward to Jericho, and they'll approach Jerusalem that way. He'll ride the donkey coming from that direction. Jesus is leading the crowd. Jesus went before them and they were amazed. Remember Passover is approaching. And they're approaching Jerusalem to worship according to the law of Moses. Go to Jerusalem three times a year. All the male Jews. Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. It's Passover coming up. He'll die on the Passover. He'll die on this Passover. This is the fourth and final Passover of his earthly ministry. Three years now he's been conducting his earthly ministry. He will die on that fourth Passover. Just before they observe it. He'll observe an early Passover. Jesus is leading the procession. He's leading the procession of these pilgrims coming from wherever. He's leading them to Jerusalem. He's at the head. He's at the head. It says they were amazed. And they followed. They were afraid. They're following and they're afraid. Now, there's a, there's a lot of trouble going on in the area of Jerusalem. Antagonism against Christ. They've been plotting to take his life for some time. And it's, it's no secret that they don't like Jesus in Jerusalem. The people in Jerusalem, the, the, the religious leaders of Israel, the nation, they're at the temple in Jerusalem. They've been scheming for many months now to put him to death. And he says, we go to Jerusalem. We go to Jerusalem. I must go to Jerusalem, Mark 8, 31, to fulfill prophecy. I must go to Jerusalem. Now, John alone has this. Read in John 7 and John 8 and John 10. That's all in this time frame. They're plotting to put Christ to death. They're scheming. The people who are with him, to some degree, they know what's going on. They're amazed. They're afraid. He's actually going to Jerusalem, huh? To die. They were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve. He takes the twelve off to the side. And he explains to the twelve, in particular, the twelve apostles. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man shall be betrayed to the apostates. And they will condemn him to death. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles. One of his own will betray him to his apostate nation's leaders. And then his apostate nation will betray him to the Gentiles. As it turns out, Judas Iscariot, one of his... Twelve apostles, his most trusted apostle, will turn him over to the unbelieving Jewish religious leaders. And they will turn him over to the non-Jewish political leaders. They'll condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. How will, how will they put him to death? We see it in Matthew it's not in Mark, it's not in that account, it's in Matthew. Matthew 20, verse 17, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. And he shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Matthew 20 verse 19. 
They will deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. Crucifixion. They're going to put me on a cross. They're going to nail me to a cross. That's the Gentile mode of execution. That's the Roman mode of execution. That's exactly what Psalm 22 had prophesied a thousand years earlier. The Jewish mode of execution was stoning, death by stoning. But that wasn't prophecy there. Prophecy, prophecy was, they've pierced my hands and feet. Psalm 22, David wrote that. King David wrote it. Ten centuries before Calvary, David had already written, Messiah will be crucified. They'll mock him. They'll make fun of him. They'll scourge him. They'll whip him. They'll whip him. Scourging. Mocking and scourging him. During his trial, we'll see that. Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 22, Luke 23. They mock him. They make fun of him. They pretend he's a king and they, they worship him. They call him all sorts of names. They scourge him. Scourging. That's a new piece of information he hasn't revealed before. In Mark 8 and Mark 9, he didn't mention scourging. Now he says, look, in addition, I will be scourged. I will be whipped severely. Straps or cords of leather with pieces of glass or bone or metal on the ends. They're going to take those torture devices and beat me with them. I know what's coming. They will not take me by surprise. But it is my Father's will. My Father knows what's coming too. They'll scourge me. They'll also spit upon me. Contempt, disrespect. And we'll read about that too. <clears throat> Hatred. Contempt. He will be... He will be covered in the saliva of sinners. People who will punch him mercilessly and beat him with a rod. And many other graphic, horrific activities that we'll read about later. Won't be long. We'll be in those passages. They'll kill him. They'll kill me. They'll kill me. They'll crucify me. Condemn me to death. They will demand that I die the death of a common criminal, the worst criminal. That's Israel's religious leaders who will do it. We'll get rid of that Jesus once and for all. No, they won't. Mark 10, 34. He's mentioned this now three times. Mark 8, Mark 9, Mark 10. In Mark 10, just like in Mark 8 and Mark 9, in Mark 10, he ends this with, and the third day he shall rise again. Oh, yes, I will be mistreated. I will be put to death. But I will come back from the grave. Bank on it. That will not be the end of me. In addition to my father wanting me to die, I also know that my father wants me to live again, and I'll do that as well. So they will not make a full end of me. In the book of John, I will lay down my life. I, my father has given me that commandment, that power 
to lay down my life. But at the same time, I have also been given that power to pick it up again, and I will. I will, re I will return from the grave. On the third day, I'll rise again. Resurrection. Resurrection. Mark 10, 35. We don't see how they respond, huh? That's in Luke. Come over to Luke. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And the third day he shall rise again. Luke 18.34 And they understood none of these things, and the saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. God has now hidden it from their sight. They can't see what's coming now. He's hidden it from them. See, if he had to teach them about what was coming, they weren't preaching our gospel message, huh? They weren't preaching, Christ will die for our sins. He'll be buried and he'll be raised again. They weren't saying that. The Lord Jesus was the one who finally revealed to them. Mark 8, Matthew 16. For the first time over two and a half years, roughly two and a half years in his earthly ministry, now he tells them he's going to die. They know he was going to die prior to that. Prior to that, they had no understanding of his death. Now that he tells them, there's more and more enlightenment. He tells them more. And then eventually, he blinds them so they can't see. So they will not prevent these events from coming to pass. Because this is the way Father God wants this to transpire. I have to die. I have to die. And we'll see. What occurs? Mark 10, verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant us, grant unto us, that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized withal shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him, and saith unto them, Ye you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Come over to Matthew, the parallel, Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Slightly different wording, but it's the same account. Same event. Matthew 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Similar language. Similar language. It's the same account, though. Just from a different perspective. Matthew 20, verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons. That's James and John, of course. Worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, 
Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Only Matthew and Mark have this account. And when we conflate them, we see the apostles James and John, along with their mother, the wife of Zebedee, the sons of Zebedee, and this wife of Zebedee, they approach the Lord Jesus Christ, they heard him speak earlier, and this is only in Matthew 19, 28, about sitting on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Well, James and John and their mother. Matthew focuses on the mother. Mark focuses on the two sons. But all three share a desire that the two sons, James and John, would sit on the right hand of Christ in his kingdom and the left hand of Christ in his kingdom. Oops. In these eastern kingdoms here, the left and right hand of the king were the two most important positions under him, of course. This woman, as we see in Matthew, she tries to sweet talk Jesus. And James and John too, they come worship him. They're trying to get his attention. Flatter him. The woman, she's sincere. She wants the absolute best for her sons. Can my two sons sit on your left and right hands in your kingdom? They will sit on 12 thrones. Can they have the two best spots though? Can they have the two preeminent positions? Well, the woman is sincere, but this is selfish. Okay? This, this, is, this has man at the center, not Jesus Christ. As opposed to being concerned with, can these two mortal men have the preeminence? How about... They say, the Lord Jesus Christ has the preeminence. Not worry about servants of God and, 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 and common saints of God. What about Almighty God here having the center place? Having the central spot. Having the preeminence. Having the attention. Instead of worrying about, let's have James and John at the center. Sinners at the center of attention have the Savior at the center. What would ye that I should do for you? Mark 10, 36. He brings them to confession. Tell me. He knows what they want. He, he wants them to confess. Admit. Admit. What do you want? Grant us. Mark 10, 37. That we may sit one on thy right hand, and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what you ask. You don't know what you're asking. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Drinking of the cup, and being baptized with the baptism there. Drinking of the cup, 
The cup is often a symbol of God's wrath. He informs his disciples, his two apostles there, you will drink that cup. Verse 39. It wouldn't be God's wrath there. The cup is in God's wrath. The cup is rejection. Okay? You're going to be rejected of men. If you want to call it man's wrath, go ahead. You'll be rejected of men just like I'm rejected of men. You'll be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. That is an order. The Lord Jesus Christ was already water baptized. He's looking for a future baptism. He was water baptized back in Mark 1, almost three years earlier. This baptism is not water. See what I told you? When you see baptism in the Bible, don't automatically assume it's water. Here, it can't be water. He was already water baptized. But he says, I am waiting for a baptism to come. That's alluded to in Luke 12. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till I, it be accomplished? The baptism there is his death. The baptism and the death. He will be identified with death. He will die. You apostles here, you two apostles, James and John, if you want to sit on my right hand and on my left hand, well, instead of focusing on who's going to sit and reign on my left and right hands, for now, my desire is to be rejected of men and die. You should be focused on that for now. Persecutions, Mark 10, 30. Mark 10, 39, they say, we can, we can be baptized with that baptism of death. We can drink of that cup of rejection. You can, huh? Mark 10, 39. Well, you will. You shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized with all, shall ye be baptized. In the coming years, Acts chapter 12, James will die by beheading. He's a picture of the little flock under Antichrist dying. Revelation 20 verse 4. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. In Matthew in Matthew 20, it's, it's not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. My Father will decide who sits on my right hand and my left hand in the kingdom. I won't. See, See that? He's submitting to the Father. He's not going to choose. Yeah, you'll sit on my right hand, you'll sit on my left hand. He says, no, it's not my place to choose who's on the right, who's on the left. My father's going to do that, and I defer you to him. Let him take care of it. I'm submitting to my father's will. See? Now watch this. Pride. Splitting up the little flock again. Now it's the twelve apostles. The ten remaining apostles... Mark 10, 41, when the ten heard it, that James and John wanted preferential treatment, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Mm -hmm. That ugly head of pride and selfishness. Here it is. The ten against the two. Ah, that reminds me of the ten northern tribes pitted against the two southern tribes, huh? Centuries before. That divided kingdom. Kingdom of Israel in the north. Kingdom of Judah in the south. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know 
that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. He has to correct them again. Correct them again. Back in Mark chapter 9, back in Mark chapter 9, verse 33, he came to Capernaum. And being in the house, he asked them, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace. For by the way, 34, they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and servant of all. Hmm... They had argued there. Matthew 18 was the parallel for that. Matthew 18, remember? Matthew 18, 1, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a child, a little child unto him. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble, 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 humble himself as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humility. So Matthew chapter 18 and Mark chapter 9. Matthew 18 and Mark 9, they argued over who was the greatest among them. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Eh? Competition. And he taught them, be humble. Be humble. Be last of all. Be servant of all if you want to be first. You see, he, he, he could have told them, look, I'm greater than all of you put together. I'm the greatest. Okay. And here they are squabbling about who's greatest among them. He's the greatest among them. Okay. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And they, they disputed about that. So he taught them humility, 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 Matthew 18 and Mark 9. No, don't worry about common mortal men. Worry about the God man. He's the one who's the greatest. He's the greatest in the kingdom. So the Lord Jesus Christ has to correct them. Kick pride aside. Kick self aside. If you want to be greatest, you have to adopt my mentality. I'm servant of all. I've chosen to be servant of all. I'm greater than all of you put together. And yet look what I'm doing. I'm submitting to my Father's will. You should set aside self. Look on the things of others and not on the things of yourselves. Because here am I. I'm not looking on the things of myself. I'm looking on the things of my Father. My Father. So they squabble. In Mark chapter 10. So now Mark 10, Matthew 20. They're at each other's throats again. And now it's, this time it's because James and John and their mother have been asking, can James and John sit on the right and left hands in my kingdom? So they're arguing again. They haven't learned the lesson that he taught them in Matthew 18 and Mark 9. Now in Mark 10, Matthew 20. The little flock is split once more because of pride. James and John, troublemakers, really. See, the, the God of the Bible is honest about his people. The Bible isn't man's book. The Bible is God's book, and it, it tells on man. It reveals man's weaknesses. 
the ten became envious. This, these remaining ten apostles became envious, jealous when they heard that request. We can be sure Satan was quite happy here. Triviality has distracted the little flock. Silliness is conquering and dividing them. Rather than exalting Jesus Christ, they're exalting self. Their mother, she's well intended, I suppose. But her flesh is working. James and John's flesh, both of their flesh, are working there. The ten, their flesh is working. It's nothing but a flesh parade. And they, they're, they're irritated with one another. The ten against the two. Jesus called them unto him. They haven't learned the lesson. Let, let me tell it again. Let me share the lesson again. You haven't gotten it yet, Israel. Israel's little flock. But Jesus called them to him, Mark 10, 42, and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are counted to rule over the Gentiles, exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. Not in God's kingdom. That attitude exists among the pagans, bullies, despots, dictators. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even... The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. We want to be the boss. James and John wanted to be the boss. They wanted to be bosses. They want to bully people. They want to be in control. They want to have power. It's a power grab. Let us have that power. Oh, and it's not to govern for God's glory. It's to govern for self. Selfish. Selfish. You see, rulers should be benevolent. That's how God rules. He rules for the good of the people under him, the creatures in his world. He rules for their benefit. Man's sinful flesh doesn't have that attitude. Man's sinful flesh, our sinful flesh is I. S-I-N, S-I-N, me, I want to have the power. I want to control people. I want to boss people around. I want to be a bully, despot, dictator, tyrant. The Lord Jesus Christ said, that attitude does not belong in God's kingdom. That's not my mentality, and that's not your mentality either. You're supposed to be thinking like saints. You're thinking like lost people here. You notice the Gentiles, the Gentiles there, Mark 10, 42, that's pagans. That's pagans. Okay? That's the nation. That's the people down at the bottom in darkness. They don't have God's word there. Israel has God's word. Israel has God's word. Jesus is correcting their fallacious mindset. In Luke 22, in Luke 22, watch, listen to Luke 22. They're going to argue again about who's the greatest in the kingdom. The night of the Last Supper, the Passover there, just before Christ's crucifixion, just before his trial, they argue again, isn't this dumb? How dumb! The flesh. Ministry is not a competition. If you think it is, my friend, if you think the Christian life is, you shouldn't have gotten in the ministry. You should have never become a Christian. Christian living is the life of Christ. Okay? The life of Christ is Philippians 2. The mind of Christ is thinking about others, not thinking about self. Putting aside self. The disciples have not put aside self. Look in Mark Chapter 9, Matthew 18. Look at Mark 10, Matthew 20. Now look at Luke 22, the third time. Still haven't put aside self. Luke 22, 23. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. Who's going to betray him? Who? 
And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. Ah, here they go again. And he said unto them, I'm going to teach you a third time. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them, or call benefactors, but ye shall not be so, but he that is great, uh, greatest among you, let him be as the younger, the nobody in other words, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve, for whether is greater he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. I could be having people serve me. I'm the greatest here. I've chosen rather to serve others. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father. My father hath appointed unto me that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And sit, upon, sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. There's the kingdom again. My, my father gives me a kingdom. I give you a kingdom. The kingdom isn't yours. The kingdom really isn't mine. It's my father's. Stop arguing over who's, who, who's the greatest in the kingdom. My father determines that. My father, really, his father had determined he was the greatest. The Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest. But the disciples, when they heard, oh, somebody's going to, be, somebody's going to be, betray him. Oh, it's not me. I'm the greatest. I would never do that. No, me. I'd never do it. You, you're not that reliable. I am the one who won't betray him. You will. See, they were arguing. Who won't do it? Well, the one who eventually did betray him was the least likely, least suspected, the most trusted, Judas Iscariot. Hmm. So much for depending on man, huh? Didn't work out. Mark 10, Mark 10, they exercise lordship over each other among the Gentiles. Bullies, that's not, that doesn't belong in my kingdom. Lordship, exercise dominion, lording over believers, believers lording over each other. 1 Peter 5, listen, 1 Peter 5, 1, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. They're waiting for his return. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. They'll be lords over God's heritage. Bullies. Now that was the mindset there. In Mark 10, that Jesus Christ was discouraging among his disciples. 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1. Listen to this one. Here's the Apostle Paul. And this mentality is all too often lacking among Christian leaders. 2 Corinthians 1. 24, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. I'm not going to be a bully. The Apostle Paul told them, I'm giving you a chance to straighten up on your own before I come over there and force you. As opposed to me coming over and twisting arms, I don't have dominion over your faith. I do want to help you in your Christian walk, but I'm not going to force you. If you want to be ignorant and carnal, confused, in darkness, blindness, go ahead. But so shall it not be among you, Mark 10, 43. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, servant, servant. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. And remember... Here's the key verse in Mark. Mark 10, 45. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. He didn't tell them, put others ahead of yourself. He actually did it too. He told them and he did it himself. In other words, he practiced what he preached. The Lord Jesus Christ said, follow my example. Here am I. I'm the chiefest. 
I can be the one being served here, but instead of that, I am serving others. I have come. The Son of Man hasn't come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That's Matthew 20, verse 28, too. Ma Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Mark 10.45 is the key verse of Mark. He's servant. Jesus Christ is servant. He's Father God's servant. He's come to give his life a ransom for many. In Philippians 2, Philippians 2, Philippians 2, verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of, and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each other, let each esteem other, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He's serving Father God. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I've come to give my life a ransom for many. Oh, 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 oh people struggle with that. Matthew 20, 28 and Mark 10, 45. Why does it say he gave his life a ransom for all? Did Jesus die for some or for all? The Calvinists, T-U-L-I-P, the Calvinists have a five-point doctrinal acrostic there. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And that gets so complicated, and it's not but lost people's mentality there. Christians thinking like lost people or lost people thinking like lost people. Limited atonement in Calvinism is the idea that Jesus died for only certain people. He didn't die for everybody. He only died for people who'd be saved. He didn't die for all, only for those who, who, whom God would give faith to. God gives the gift of faith to them. And Jesus died for those to whom God would give faith. And all sorts of nonsense like that. Faith is not a gift. The gift of Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is salvation, not faith. Faith is believing what God said. God doesn't need to give us the ability to believe what He said. He simply gives us what He said and He expects us to believe it. That's our responsibility to believe. And he is not responsible if we don't believe. See, if, if he's required to give us faith, then that means for those who don't believe, it's not their fault they couldn't believe. God didn't give them faith. See, and it blames God for their unbelief. No, it's sinful man. That's the problem. He's the one in unbelief because he chose to be in unbelief. Jesus Christ came to give his life a ransom for many. That's Matthew 20, 28 and Mark 10, 45. Who's the many? He gave his life like a purchase payment to buy souls out of the slave market of sin. Ransom, the price of a slave, paid there. Who is the many? Well, come back to Isaiah 53 the prophetic program already predicted who was the many. For whom would Christ die? Isaiah 53, verse 8. For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Isaiah 53, 8. That 
write that cross-reference, Isaiah 53, 8, at Matthew 20, verse 28, and Mark 10, 45. Israel is the many there. For the transgression of Isaiah's people was Messiah stricken. Why does it say many there? I thought Jesus died for all. Why does it say many there? Well, how could he die simply for Israel in Matthew and Mark? Well, see, you get that from Paul about he died for all. See, dispensationally delivered, now we see why the Bible says this here and why it says something else in Matthew and Mark. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And remember, the, to be testified in due time, the message that Christ died for all, is to be testified in due time. What is that due time? Verse 7, never read 1 Timothy 2.6 without 1 Timothy 2.7, whereunto I, Paul, am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. It's in the writings of Paul, Romans through Philemon. Now we see salvation is not restricted to the nation Israel. That's prophecy there. But mystery, the church, the body of Christ, Paul's ministry. Now salvation, Christ died for all. That message, God kept it secret until he revealed it to and through the Apostle Paul. And now the Apostle Paul writes about it. See that? Christ died for many in the prophetic program because that was the order of the covenants. Israel's to be blessed and saved first. Look at Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 3, for example. We could go to various other verses. We could look at them. Acts 3, Acts 5. Israel's to be saved first. They're to be forgiven first. And now, through the writings of Paul, we learn Salvation, it goes to all the world. All. If we don't understand the Bible dispensationally, we will draw wrong conclusions. There was a time when, yes, Christ died for many, not all. Now, it's all. It's a message given to and through the Apostle Paul. If we ignore Paul's special ministry, then what are we going to do? Run to Matthew 20, 28 and Mark 10, 45 and teach... False doctrine. Because those verses are not true today. 1 Timothy 2. 6 and 7. That's true today. Gentiles. All Jews and all Gentiles can come by faith to Father God through Jesus Christ's finished cross work. He gave himself a ransom for all. That was to be preached at a particular time. What's the particular time? The dispensation of the grace of God. Paul's epistles. Paul's ministry, Romans 2, Philemon. All right, so that's enough. We'll finish Mark 10 next time. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who died for our sins, who was buried and who was raised again the third day, that we simply believe on him to have forgiveness of sins and eternal life with you in heaven. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for this opportunity to teach. And may you edify, encourage us, and enlighten us in our next study as we finish Mark chapter 10. Thank you, in Christ's name, amen.